Hello, I'm Pastor Mark Biddy from Harvest Baptist Church in Dawsonville, Georgia. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for watching this YouTube video and invite you to our services here at the church. We're located at 123 John Perry Road, Dawsonville, Georgia. Our service times are Sunday morning, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, 11 o'clock morning worship, 6 o'clock evening worship. We also have a Wednesday midweek service where we meet at 7 o'clock for prayer, 7.30 for service. You can find more information about us on our website, www.harvest-baptistchurch.com. Again, thank you for watching this YouTube video. I hope it is an encouragement and a challenge to you. May the Lord bless you. Take your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter number 31. Most of you know the passage that I'm going to. And uh, I pray and ask the Lord's blessings and ask the Lord's direction. I believe that I found the mind of the Lord for the message today. And uh, try to encourage our moms. Let me say this. <clears throat> I know uh, for me, uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day is a very, very sweet occasion. It brings back a great deal of memories and it brings back a great deal of, uh, of spiritual memories in my life because... I do have a goodly heritage. I have a godly foundation. And uh, my parents were used of the Lord to instill many things in me. Uh, and uh, when it comes to salvation, I had to get saved on my own. I could not ride my parents' salvation. Uh, I did not, I, I'm not a Christian because they were Christians, but they did point me to Christ. And uh, because of that, at a very early age, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, we've got a lot of memories around the bedside and Bible reading and prayer. And uh, when my friends would come over, uh, we didn't not have Bible reading and prayer that night. We had it. And uh, if they were Catholic or if they were non-Christian, if they were whatever they were, it didn't matter. Uh, they were at our house and they did things our way. And we had Bible reading and prayer. And I've talked with many of them since then growing up. And they said those were all, always special times for them. And so the Lord uh, has allowed Mother's Day and Father's Day to be a very special time for me. And there are those that when it comes to Mother's Day and Father's Day, you do not have a spiritual heritage. So therefore, when you come to the house of God on Mother's Day or Father's Day and you hear everybody talk about their godly mothers, and it may not bring up the spiritual memories that I have. But your kids could have them. And your grandchildren could have them. I've never studied my family history back very far. I know that my grandparents were saved. Uh, I had the privilege of growing up next door to uh, my mom's mom and dad, Granny and Pa, and um, spent a lot of time with them. They were very godly people and had a great godly influence in my life. And uh, I look back on that, but, but past them, I, I really don't know my spiritual heritage as far as how far it goes back. I don't know where it started. But thank God it did. It started somewhere. And your spiritual heritage may start with you. And it may go from you to your children and then your children to your grandchildren and so on and so forth. Um, but if it hasn't started yet, who better to start it with than you? You can be the one that starts a goodly and godly heritage for your children. And uh, I thank the Lord for that. So if you don't have a lot of spiritual memories around Mother's Day and Father's Day, you can start making some. And you can make some for your children and grandchildren. And I pray that you will do uh, just that. Psalms 31, stand with me if you will. We'll not be lengthy in our reading. Uh, we'll read one verse, have a word of prayer, let you be seated. And then we're going to cover several verses throughout this chapter. Verse number 28 is where our, our text will be. Uh, so Proverbs 31, verse number 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of the word. Thank you for the good time we've had. Thank you for all the moms that are here and the blessings that uh, we have with each one. Lord, I pray that, uh, as I've already mentioned, if there's not a godly heritage behind a family that is here, I pray, Lord, that they would purpose in their heart that it begins now and goes forward, that they would make a, a goodly and godly heritage for their children and their children's children. I ask you, Lord, that you take the Word of God and feed us and help us. Lord, I know that uh, this is Mother's Day and this is geared toward mothers. 
But Lord, also there's a great deal of truth for a father, for a son, for a daughter. I pray, Lord, that you speak to our hearts. Lord, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that does not know you as their Savior, what a great, great day it would be. Mother's Day 2018 to be saved by your marvelous grace. Help us now, we pray. Guard our tongue. Let me say everything I ought to say. Nothing I should not. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I came across this and I liked it. I don't know if I've ever read this or not. Uh, I did not remember doing it. I wanted to go through it. Uh, the 13 different things that we learned from our mothers. Said my mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> my mother taught me about receiving. You're going to get it when we get home. My mother taught me about a challenge, to meet a challenge. What were you thinking? Answer me when I'm talking to you. Amen. And then, don't talk back to me. Number four, my mother taught me logic. If you fall out of that swing and break your neck, you're not going to go to the store with me. <laughs> my mother taught me uh, medical science. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they're going to freeze that way. Who knew? My mother taught me to think ahead. If you don't pass your spelling test, you'll never get a good job. My mother taught me ESP. Put on your sweater. Don't you think I know when you're cold? My mother taught me humor. When the lawnmower cuts your toes off, don't come running to me. <laughs> My mother taught me about how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. My mother taught me about genetics. You're just like your father. <laughs> My mother taught me about my roots. What, were you raised in a barn? My mother taught me about the wisdom of the age. When you get to be my age, you'll understand. And then, my all-time favorite, my mother taught me about justice. One day you'll have kids, and I hope they turn out just like you. <laughs> then you'll see what it's like. Amen. And uh, so regardless of what we learn from our moms, we learn a lot. And uh, certainly our mothers have played a great, great role in our lives. In our text here, in Proverbs chapter 31, I know many of you know this to be the story and the, the uh, teaching of the virtuous woman, beginning in verse number 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? He goes on down to mention several things. I want to go through this chapter and uh, talk a little bit about the, the importance of a godly mother. Again, if you did not have a godly mother, you can be a godly mother. If you didn't have a godly grandmother, you can be a godly grandmother. It's got to start somewhere. So regardless of your background, regardless of where you came from, regardless of your situation and circumstance, there is something for you to do as a child of God and as a mom today. And by the way, uh, this can be applied to a father as well. I, I believe it doesn't take a village to raise a child, but it does take a home. And a home, biblically speaking, a home is a father and a mother and then those children, biblically speaking. I understand that there are circumstances beyond our control sometimes and it may just be a mother. It may just be a father. There may be uh, issues that you could not control. There may be issues from your past that have caused things and, and, and things are not in the biblical order. And I understand that there is grace for you. There is a God of heaven that loves you and cares for you and, and, and encourages you and helps you through those things. But we never want to shy away from the biblical model of a home when it comes to raising children. But as a mother, as you look at this virtuous woman, as you look at uh, this lady that the Bible is telling us about, there are several key elements that we'll see uh, that would do us all well as mother, uh, you as a mother, and me as a father even, it would do us well to, to have these things in our lives and, and make them very important in our lives. Number one, I want to draw your attention to the fact that this godly mother, this virtuous woman, if you will, I want you to notice her teaching. Verse number one through nine, we see the teaching that this woman put in to her son. The Bible said in verse number one, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What my son and what the son of my womb, what the son of my vows. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which, king, which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings. 
kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. There is a teaching that this uh, lady engaged in in raising her children. Number one, she taught about the scriptures. Verse number one, the Bible said the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. She is teaching him the scriptures. There's an emphasis, and we'll see that in just a moment. There's an emphasis also in her son's name by which he was called that points out this was a godly mother that was teaching some things about scripture and things from the Lord. Can I say this? It is of utmost importance as a mom that you take, I was talking about in Sunday school, that you take on a spiritual leadership role in your children's life. Now, you will never be the spiritual leader over your husband. That's his job. That's his responsibility. The husband is to be the spiritual leader of the home. But you understand, as a mom, you do have a responsibility to be the spiritual leader over your children. You've got to step into that role uh, in most cases. And I know that it varies from family to family. And in our case, it was this way. I, I spent about 90% of the time away from home. So Mandy had the kids 90% of the time I was there 10% of the time uh, because I would get up before the kids would go, uh, before they would get up. I would go to work. I'd come home and spend a couple hours with them and then they were in the bed and it was like that day in and day out when the children were young. Things have changed a little bit now. I am, uh, I do spend a little bit more time working at home and things of that nature now. Uh, but as, especially Ashley and Jeb, when they were little, man, I just had limited time with them. And if their spirituality hinged totally upon me, they would have been very deprived in the spiritual content in their lives. But a godly mother stepped up and stepped into that role and gave spiritual leadership and taught them the Word of God and taught them the things of God. So many school days, Mandy has sat down with the kids and went through their Bible studies together and, and read Scripture with them. And many of the things that they've learned, the foundational truths they've learned from the, from the uh, Word of God, they didn't learn in a Sunday school class and thank God for Sunday school. And they didn't learn with the pastor preaching and thank God for preaching pastors. They learned at home under the tutelage of their mother because she was a spiritual influence in their life. So this... this this mom is teaching about Scripture. Secondly, she taught about surrender. I believe it's very important that we teach our children the importance of surrendering to the Lord or submitting to the Lord. Verse number two, the Bible said, what my son, what the son of my wound? Listen to this next thing. And what the son of my vows? She had made some promises. This word vow means a promise to the Lord, a, 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 a promise or a commitment that she'd made to the Lord. She said, this is my son of my vows. So this son had uh, brought up a commitment in her her life to the Lord. Notice, if you will, the name of the king Lemuel. It means his name meant belonging to God. This mom named her son that this boy belongs to God and, and he is the son of her vows, her promises and her commitments to the Lord. She had taught him from an early age the idea of submitting and surrendering to the Lord. I believe with all of my heart it is vitally important that we as parents teach our children the importance of submission. Because guess what? Everybody will always have somebody to submit to. Everybody. It doesn't matter how far you walk up the ladder of success. When you get to the top and you think you own it all, guess what? Your stockholders are going to be, they're going to be breathing down your neck. He said, oh man, I own the company. So what you own the company? You may be the CEO of a big company, but that company's owned by a lot of other people. And when the stocks start going down, guess whose phone's going to ring? Guess where the pressure's going to come? When the company starts to go down, guess what? It's not just going to be a fallout underneath you. It's going to be a fallout all the way to the top because everybody will always have someone to submit to. When you get to going down the road, guess what? When you get out on the road and you're on a public road, you have somebody to submit to. They got lights on top of their car. They wear a uniform. And you have a responsibility to submit to them. 
Guess what? When they turn the blue lights on and you take off and, and you say, I'm not going to stop. They don't take that well. They don't say, well, bless their hearts. They never learned submission. I think I'll let them go. No. They say, I think this one needs a lesson in submission. And they're going to go cause them to, and if they can't get them to submit, they will cause them to surrender. And there's a difference. I'd whole lot rather submit to God than Him bring circumstances in my life to cause me to surrender to Him. Surrendering means I can't do anything else. Submission means I bow to your authority. She had taught them about submission. She had taught them about giving to the Lord. Remember the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, uh, 26 said, and she said, Oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord for this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition which I ask of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. She said, this, uh, Lord, you've given me the, the request, you've given me this child and now I want you to know I give him back to you. He is yours and that's the idea of this virtuous woman. She is a woman. I'm talking about a praiseworthy mother. Someone, verse 28, where her children arise up and call her blessed. Why did they do this? Because she had taken time to teach them scripture. She had taken time to teach them submission and in so doing, they, raised, they, arrived, they rose up and called her blessed. Notice not only she taught them about the scriptures, she taught them about surrender or submission. She taught them about sin. In verse number three, she taught them about the sin of fornication and adultery. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. That should be a good lesson for mothers to teach their children. Amen. Moms ought to teach their kids to keep their hands to themselves. Moms ought to teach their kids that you are not to be in inappropriate contact. Moms ought to teach their kids, by the way, dads, you ought to reinforce it because guess what? It ain't cute. You say, oh, look, isn't that cute? Oh, Johnny and Susie walking hand in hand. Guess what? They're hand in hand in front of you, but they're a whole lot more to a whole lot more when you ain't around. It's no longer hand to hand. They're walking, oh, they're sweet and cute and walking along. Hey, why don't you take the biblical approach in teaching your children it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Right. Oh, hallelujah. Hey, man, I just felt like there was some left over from Brother Stacy the other night. He hit that a little bit the other night. I don't know if he finished or not. Moms... Dads, it's our responsibility as parents to teach our children the proper communication and proper way to engage with the opposite sex. It's our responsibility. What are you going to do? Let Disney Channel do it? Disney Channel's got a huddle up, huddled up somewhere in the corner of a high school, or actually it's a middle school, cuddled up in the corner somewhere getting their first kiss in middle school. What's wrong with their first kiss coming on the platform on their wedding day? What's wrong with that? You say, oh, preacher, you're crazy. You think somebody ought to, ought to wait? Yes, I do. He said, oh, preacher, now, listen. I wouldn't buy a car if I didn't test drive it. My truck that I bought, I didn't even crank it. I looked at it and said, I like it, but I ain't getting in it until I sign the papers. <laughs> Help me now. You look at a girl and you say, I, I like her. Yeah, but you ain't getting her till the papers are done. You're not getting her till the ceremony's done. You say, oh, he is dreamy. He is handsome. Well, that's fine. But you don't have contact with him until the deal is done. And that deal is the wedding ceremony. Hallelujah. I know it's not popular. And I know most people don't like it. But I'm going to keep preaching it. I'm going to keep preaching it to my children. I'm going to preach it to your children. As long as you'll keep them here, I promise you this, I will preach to them that they ought to keep their hands to their self. That's what this, pro this uh, preacher, oh, I want to be a virtuous woman. But Susie looks so sweet in that little short dress. Amen. It's Mother's Day, so we're just going to go ahead and deal with stuff. He said, I want to be a virtuous woman preacher. I want to be that virtuous woman the Bible talks about. Why is it then Johnny's allowed to run around and do whatever he wants to? By the way, I don't know who Johnny and Susie are, but they were bad kids. 
every preacher talks about Johnny and Susie and all the things that they did and how they were cute, but it wasn't good. John, why is Johnny running around doing anything he wants to? Why is he not supervised? Hey, guys are jerks and girls are stupid. That is my philosophy. It's been my philosophy for a long time. I've told people that. And if young people get a hold of that early in their life, it will help them. <laughs> Whew. Hallelujah. I thought a few more moms and dads would agree with that. Talked about sin, the sin of deception. Notice, turn with me to Proverbs chapter number 6. Proverbs chapter number 6. I want to mention there, there's a few things that Proverbs mentions about the deception of this relationship between a man and a woman. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 24, the Bible said, "...to keep thee from the evil woman." From the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her, with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Notice chapter number 7, verse number 7. I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner. He went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle the heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abiding on in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impotent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day. I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. For the goodman is not at home. He has gone a long journey, hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after a straight way as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dark strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her past, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men, yea, uh, have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. This virtuous woman, this praiseworthy mother, whose children rise up and call her blessed, she took time to tell her son, there is a way that destroys kings, and it's going after a strange woman. It's going after a strange woman. By the way, in today's society, it's not just a smooth talking girl. And that's what this, that's what Proverbs chapter 7 is. It was a smooth talking woman alluring a young man to her. That's not the way it is these days. In a lot of cases, it's the exact opposite. It's a smooth talking guy. Society has painted it that way. I encourage you, I, I know some of you ladies at work, and I don't know why I'm getting bogged down on this, except for the fact I love you and I want to help you. Some of you ladies have jobs and you work in the public eye. You be careful with that guy that likes to spend time with you. Be careful with the guy that wants to take you to lunch. Yeah. Hey Amen. If he's married, and if you're married, he has no reason asking you to lunch and you have no reason going. Yeah. He said, well, we're business associates. That's fine. Be business associates. But you ain't got to be lunch associates. Be careful when he comes in your office, your little cubicle, and tells you how good you look that day. It just may be he's a snake in the grass. Hey Amen. Hey, if he's got a wife at home, he ought to tell her how good she looks. And your husband ought to tell you how good you look and leave that alone at that. Guard yourselves. And by the way, guys, you're at work and that woman comes walking through and she's friendlier than all the other women. Just go ahead and put an X on her. Mark her. Stay away from her. And I'll say this. If your wife ever comes up to you and says, stay away from her, stay away from her. Amen. My wife has a keen sense. And there's been a few people that my wife has said, Honey, and she looks at me very sternly. It's not disrespectful. It is attention grabbing. She looks at me. And her head does this number. Her finger comes up. And she says, Mark Biddy, don't you ever, ever be anywhere near that woman alone. 
Yes, ma'am. You know why? You know why she does that? Because I'm hers. I'm hers. And she's protecting me. I firmly believe she'd fight for me. <laughs> now I know, I know that's crazy to all y'all to think she would fight for me. I know that, but she would. And I'd fight for her too. I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. Be careful. She taught him about deception. Then she taught him about drinking. Amen. Verse number four said, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, lest for, uh, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. By the way, let me say this. There is nothing positive taught in Scripture about drinking alcoholic beverages. Amen. In any content, in any case, or in any amount, there is nothing positive in Scripture written about drinking alcoholic beverages. Amen. Nothing. He said, well, the Bible talks about wine. Oh, I'm so sick of hearing about wine for the stomach's sake. What you ought to do is take your Bible and study it. And figure out what the Bible's talking about. And when the Bible's talking about the fruit of a vine. And when the Bible's talking about a fermented drink. Right. You ought to take the Word of God, break it down, and rightly divide the Word of God. I like Brother Troy. He used to tell me, he said he, he, he went to a man's vineyard one time. And the guy took him out of the back porch. He said, look over my wine. It was a bunch of grapes on the vine. He said, look at my fruit of the vine. Did it occur to you why in, in olden days, in olden days, the only way they could keep grape juice was to bottle it with a small amount of fermentation. It did ferment and it became wine. They tell me, now I don't know this, they tell me that that wine was was a very, very small percentage of alcohol. I don't know that. Anyway, I'm against, I'm a, I'm a teetotaler when it comes to alcohol. I'm against it all. Amen. I'm against alcohol. But they, take the marriage of Cana. The marriage of Cana, Jesus comes in and, and Jesus' mother, Mary, says, uh, hey, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Because they've run out of wine at the marriage of Cana. And he says, woman, what, I have, to do, what have I to do with thee? But he, he then turns the water into wine. That's where the story becomes miraculous. Jesus turns the water into wine. But you know, the, the uh, rulers came to him, uh, the rulers of the house there came to Jesus and they said, or, or they came to the, the one who had the party and said, how is it that you save the best for last? He said, normally people serve the best and then after they're drunk, they get the worst. But they serve the worst and then the best was at last. Here's why. The fermentation process was nothing more than controlling the rot of the grape juice. So when they would drink it, they were drinking half rotten grape juice. Yummy. But when Jesus turned the water into wine, he turned it into fresh grape juice that had not been rotten, hadn't had anything added to it. And they come to him and begin drinking and said, man, this is a whole lot better than what we've been drinking. Amen. Non-rotten grape juice is better than rotten grape juice. Amen. I know some will want to argue that point, but I can't argue with you about it. Amen. Drinking is wrong. Amen. And then and you say, I want a mother that her children rise up and call her blessed. Well, why don't you teach them about sin? Amen. Teach them about things that are wrong. Uh, Dr. Jack Hiles, like him or love him, Dr. Jack Hiles, I, I heard him talk about his mom, said his mom would take magazines and she would cut out beer ads and wine ads and she would take that page out and she would put it in the floor and she'd stomp it. She said, bad, Jack bad and she'd stomp it and as a little baby he'd get that and he'd stomp on that page of beer and, and, and stomp on that and bad, bad, that's, that's bad so you know what happened when he got older and somebody offered him a bottle he said that's bad, that's bad that's bad, he said preach you talking about brainwashing your children yeah I guess we won't call it that Disney Channel brainwashes them the beer ads brainwash them. Why don't we brainwash them? Why don't we wash their brain in a certain direction? Well, now, I've got to hurry because y'all having too much fun with this. 
We see her teaching. Notice, secondly, her toiling. I'm going to get to her treasure in just a moment. Verse number 13 through 24, and I'll read it all, but uh, this deals with her toiling and her work. Notice she was known for a quantity of work. Verse number 15, the Bible says, She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, a portion to her maiden, uh, maidens. Verse 16, She considereth the field, and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands. She planteth a vineyard. She had an early work. She had an earthly work. In verse number 16, she's planting a vineyard on her own. Uh, she had an enduring work. Notice verse number 18. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. Uh, verse number 21. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So she's working at nighttime. She's working when it's cold in wintertime. Verse number 27. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. This was a working woman. If you're a stay-at-home mom, don't let anybody ever tell you the only reason you stay at home is because you don't want to work. Amen. Now would be a good time for me to request a special prayer. My wife is going to see Ashland in a couple weeks. The day after she leaves, Jeb leaves to go to Mexico. Now, my wife normally watches the kids, and when she doesn't, Jeb's there to babysit, and they're both leaving. And it's going to move me and Teeb and Tinsley. say, oh, you want me to pray for you? No, I want you to pray for them. <laughs> hey, man, it's the least you can do. Pray for Teeb and Tinsley. I'm going to be the only one in charge of them for a week there. Uh, this, this woman, this, this virtuous woman, this woman whose children arise up and call her blessed, she is a working, working woman, a hard, hard worker. Um, from time to time, and we try to do it on a regular schedule. It doesn't always happen, uh, but uh, I try to stay at home uh, one day and let Mandy go do whatever she needs to do. And I try to pump up and prime up for that day because that's a hard day. I'm not equipped for that. And it put me on the roof somewhere, put me in, you know, carrying stacks of wood and working out in the sun and laboring and sweating and all that. I'm fine with that. That ain't going to bother me. Put me out in the yard all day long. That's not going to bother me. Put me, hey, put me on a treadmill. Let me run several miles. That's not going to bother me. But I am not built to stay home. It is trying. And our kids are great. It has nothing to do with our kids. It's just I'm not built for that. But we try to do it. Why is that? Because a mother's work is never done. We've heard it, but it's true. Mother's work. And you ladies who work and mother, bless your heart. Hallelujah. I hope your husband chips in some. Because if he don't, man alive, you might want to beat him. Bible said it was an enjoyable work. Verse number 18, she says, She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. There's something pleasant about the work that she was doing. She was not only known for the quantity of work, she was known for the quality of work that she did. Her merchandise was good. Her candle threw not out by night. Verse number 22, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Verse 24, her, uh, verse 24 she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchants. She's not only known for a, quali a quantity of work, she's known for a quality of work. Thank God for the attention to detail that ladies put into life. Amen. 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 This morning we were setting the table uh, getting ready for Robert and Pam to come down. And she, Mandy told me, she said, get those plates off that shelf up there, the ones with the baskets on them. I said, okay, no problem. So, Brother Scott, you'll like this because I'm pretty sure me and you are on the same boat here. And uh, I grabbed those plates and I sat them down and I distributed them around the table. Put them around there. And she walked by the table and she said, honey, I just, <laughs> she said, never mind, I'll just get it. I said, no, honey, what is it? She said, no, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. I said, honey, tell me what it is. She said, well, all the baskets are facing different directions. So when they sit down, the basket needs to be facing them. I thought, who in the world? It's going to have biscuits and gravy and eggs. Who cares what direction the basket is looking? But her attention to detail is totally different than mine. I can walk into a house and there's shoes laying in the, in the laundry room there and you step over the shoes and you go in and there's clothes on the back of the uh, sofa that the kids have left there and the kids are sitting down there and I sit down and think, man, I love a clean house. And I'm sincere about it. It's great, man. I just love coming home. There's not dust piled up. There's not dirt everywhere. I sit down and say, man, I just love living in a clean house. My wife walks in and she says, Five minutes, guys. Just five minutes of a clean house. That's all I want. I'm looking around. It's clean. Those are clean toys. 
Those are clean clothes. Those are the shoes they wear. How dirty can they be? The house is clean. Not to her. There's a difference in the attention details. She's been known for a quality work. Now I'm, I'm moving on to her treasure. Notice her treasure. Verse number 10, we find her price. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. I would not trade my mom for all the wealth in the world. Nor would I trade my wife for all the wealth in the world. Because there is nothing compares to a woman whose children will rise up and call her blessed. There is nothing compared to a woman whose husband also ariseth and praiseth her. As the word of God tells us, we see her price, we see her people. Her husband, in verse number 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Verse number uh, 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Because of this woman, because of the relationship her and her husband has, it has promoted him to a place of good standing among people because of his wife. It has been said behind every good man there is a better woman. And I agree with that. And, and wives and moms, you have the ability to make or break your husband and to make or break your children. We see her husband, her children, verse number 15. She riseth also while it is yet night, giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. Verse number 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. She has a prize, and that prize is not only her worth, but that prize is her children and her husband. Then we see her praise in verse number 28. Notice, the Bible says, her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Notice what her children said. Her children said, this is a blessed woman. The word blessed means happy. It means enjoying the things of God. That's what her children said about her. Her husband raised up and praiseth her. Her husband talks well of her. And by the way, put a, where you work, guys, I'll help you now. Where you work, that man that comes in always talking about and, and browbeating and bashing his wife, you put a mark on him, stay away from him. Stay away from him because that'll rub off on you. Amen. You got another guy that comes in and talks about how much he loves his wife and how good she is. You just hang around him. He may not only be spiritual, but he'll still help you in regards to your relationship. I, oh, man. I used to work with people. They come in talking about their old lady. Oh, man. That bothers me. Now, me and, me and Mandy, we joke back and forth. I call her woman sometimes. And we do it as a joke. I'll say, uh, I'll come in and say, woman, what's for supper? And, and it's a joke between us. She'll look at me and she'll say, man, what I put on the table. <laughs> Amen. And we go on, we have a good time about it. But you will never hear me call her a woman in a disrespectful way. Amen. And it would not be wise for you to let me hear you call your wife in a disrespectful way. Because I will probably encourage you not to do that. What her children said, what her husband said. Then notice what God said. Many daughters have done virtuous, but thou excellest them all. Verse number 30, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Remember the Bible said all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If all scripture is given by inspiration of God, then all of this Bible is God breathed. So when God said, when, 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 the, when the writer of the book of Proverbs, when this was penned, and it said, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is God's word. God is telling us there is such thing as a praiseworthy mother and a praiseworthy woman. As we stand to our feet, I'm Pastor Mark Biddy, and I would like to thank you for watching our live stream services today. We would also like to invite you to visit with us in our church. But before you go, there are a few things we'd really like for you to know. One, the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's every man, woman, boy, and girl at some point in time has sinned in their life and we were born in sin. Because of that, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. 
But that's not all the Word of God says. The good news is that same verse goes on to tell us, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans 5, 8, the Word of God says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the good news today is, you can accept Christ right now as your Savior. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We also know that the Bible tells us Jesus is given an open invitation. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. That is the invitation from Christ Himself. Thank you again for watching our live stream services. We look forward to ministering to you again in the near future. May the Lord bless you.